Elantris was beautiful once. It was called the City of the Gods, a place of power, radiance, and magic. As magnificent as Elantris was, its inhabitants were more so. Their hair, a brilliant white, their skin an almost metallic silver. The Elantrians seemed to shine like the very city itself. They were divinities. Elantris, the home of the gods, where one could live in bliss, rule in wisdom, and be worshipped for an eternity. Eternity ended ten years ago. Go to the heathen peoples of the West. Declare to them my final warning. I care nothing for the squabbles between the two sects, priests. Go convert someone who doesn't believe. You should not dismiss the offering of words so casually. Honestly, priest, do we need to go through this? Your threats hold no weight. Fjordan hasn't held any real influence for two centuries. Fjordan is more powerful now than it ever was before. The day of empire is at hand, and my glory will soon shine forth. Cannot be! Prince Raiden is stricken with the Sheo! The pagan nations of Aerilon and Teod have been blackened scars upon my land for long enough. Elantris. That Fjordel Gion is interested in Elantris for some reason. And I make it my business never to ignore what a Gion finds interesting. You seem to be rather preoccupied with a single priest, Eni. Not a priest, Uncle. A full Gion. Still only one man. How much damage can he do? Ask the Duladen Republic. I think this is the same Gion who was involved in that disaster. The holy soldiers of Fjordan would descend on the nation like hunting predators, rending and tearing the unworthy life from those who heed not my words. Convert or fall forever. There are no other choices. Every pain, Sue. Every cut. Every nick. Every bruise. And every ache. They will stay with you until you go mad from the suffering. Welcome to Elantris. And now, for our feature presentation. Graphic Audio A movie in your mind. The Flash of Earth-1 When I was a boy, I had two loves, movies and comic books. My favorite movie was The Adventures of Robin Hood, and my favorite comic was All Flash. Each issue featured the incredible stories of The Flash, a superhero who ran so fast you could barely see him. His secret identity was research scientist Jay Garrick, and somehow, he got his powers from inhaling the fumes of heavy water. Yeah, tell me about it. Even as a kid, I knew enough about science to realize heavy water fumes couldn't give Jay a bad headache, let alone amazing super-speed powers. But I also knew that like the similarly helmeted Roman god Mercury, Jay was merely a character of myth, as real as a writer's imagination. And origins, whether born on Mount Olympus or drugged by impossible gases, weren't important. I loved his stories and adventures. I loved his villains. But more than anything else, 
I love pretending one day I could be him. After all, I knew I'd never fly like Superman or find a magic ring capable of creating anything out of energy like Green Lantern or even have an invisible plane like Wonder Woman. But I could run. And maybe, somehow, I could learn to run real fast. Just like Jay Garrick. Just like The Flash. It didn't matter to me that he wasn't real. Though when I learned he was, for some inexplicable reason, I wasn't surprised. Nor was I shocked when I became more like him than I had ever dreamed. As usual, I'm running ahead of myself. As I said, Jay Garrick was real. His origin? Well, heavy water was involved, but there was actually more to it than just that. Jay was a living, breathing research scientist, and I knew it was his interest in science, related to me in those brightly colored pages, that inspired my own interests, even though Jay didn't live on the same earth as I. <sighs> Let me slow down and start over again. Even before I learned there was something called a multiverse, I knew scientists theorized the existence of many alternate dimensions, each one separated by the slimmest of temporal vibrations. If I existed on, let's call it Earth-1, then there could also be an Earth-2, an Earth-3, and so on. There was almost no limit to the number of Earths that could theoretically exist. Some of these worlds may have developed parallel evolutions, where there might be another Barry Allen police scientist. But on another Earth, Barry Allen could just as well be a composer or an assembly line worker. On still other Earths, evolution may have spun off in a completely different fashion. The entity intended to be Barry Allen might be little more than a sentient slug, although I've been called that more than once in my life. Finally, on some Earths, there might be moments of similarities, even when there were also wild divergences. That was how I saw my world, Earth-1, and Jay Garrick's world, Earth-2. When a writer on Earth-1 dreamed the adventures of a superhero named The Flash, which he then turned into my favorite comic book, he had, unbeknownst to himself, tapped into the true history of Earth-2. Our Earths were similar and yet very different. There were heroes named Superman on both worlds who came from a planet called Krypton, although at birth one was named Kal-El and the other a similar Kal-El. Once they landed on their respective Earths, the infants both received the name Clark Kent. There was also a Wonder Woman on both Earths who used the secret identity Diana Prince, but at the same time there were two completely different Green Lanterns. Mine, the one from Earth-1, received his power ring from a race of alien guardians dedicated to preserving peace throughout the universe. Earth-2's Green Lantern had a power ring with magical origins. Similarities and differences. Neither better nor worse, just different. Many Earths, many dimensions, all separate. Nobody knew how this developed, whether by chance or circumstance, but as long as the universes remained separate, nobody needed to worry. And so it went. There was a multiverse of Earths and heroes, some nearly identical to the other, most radically different. Jay and I were very different people, yet we both became the Flash. But if you're wondering what was the biggest difference between Jay and me, it may be that by the time this is heard, he'll be retired, sunning himself on his lawn in Keystone City, while I will be long dead. Graphic Audio presents DC Comics Crisis on Infinite Earths by Marv Wolfman based on a story by Marv Wolfman and George Perez all names, characters and elements are trademarks of DC Comics copyright 2009 DC Comics all rights reserved narrated by Christopher Graybill and Richard Rowan with performances by James Konachek Mort Shelby, Elizabeth Jernigan, Ren Casey, Bruce Allen Rauscher, Christopher Walker, Tim Getman, Colleen Delaney, Lily Beacon, Michael Glenn, Terence Aselford, Nanette Savard, Peter Stray, Andy Clements, Thomas Penny, David Coyne, Kate Foster, Jonathan Watkins, Tim Carlin, Casey Platt, Scott McCormick, Stephen Carpenter, Ken Jackson, Sonny Lasky, Eric Messner, Elizabeth Demery, Dolores King Williams, Joe Brack, Sherry Simpson, Jeff Baker, 
and Bobby Aselford. It's not as if one ever really gets used to watching himself die. But I had, through the multiple viewings, become detached from the actual event. Still, I can barely explain what went through my mind that very first time. Well, of course there was denial. The body? It had to be some other Flash from some other Earth. No way it was me. But of course it was. I was alive and I was watching myself die like it was a movie trailer for my death, coming soon to a cemetery near you. How was it possible? Just an instant before I was with my wife Iris. How could I have been there and then in the next moment, gone? The well-documented stages of denial. I saw, I refused to believe, then I freaked. No! I ran away. I came back, but my body was already gone, dissolved into nothingness. Only my ring and my uniform, my tattered uniform, remained. And all that happened in a singular, frozen moment. Time stood still, but I was used to that. My internal clock regularly moved faster than imagination. Unless I concentrated and forced myself to slow down and live in the real world, everything around me moved in slow motion. I stared at that empty place where I died less than a second before, and I heard myself. <sighs> then I broke free and ran away as fast as I could, and this time I didn't come back. That was my virgin death experience. The second time I saw myself die was only marginally better. I still refused to believe what happened, but my brain was slowly grinding its way into gear. That was me who had died, or who will die. Thought one, since this was obviously taking place in the future, was it possible I could prevent it? Thought two, no, my future was set. You can't change the future. I was dead. Thoughts three through six. What killed me? Was I the only one affected? Were there others? How could I help them? <laughs> I again went into shock. I tried to fight my way out of it, but found that I couldn't. Instead, I sped up my metabolism and pushed my way through. Okay, I'm dead. Get over it. Do something about it. Which is what I did. The third time, this last time, I was finally able to separate myself from the experience. Barry Allen was a forensic scientist. I needed to study my death, analyze it, learn from it. As my flesh disintegrated, I observed burn marks at the ragged edges. They weren't caused by fire. Assuming the power necessary to disintegrate flesh and bone, I decided I'd been attacked by some sort of energy blast. Unbelievable? No. Been there, I thought, though not exactly with this result. I've led a life others would call science fiction, and energy blasts, the good kind and the bad, were definitely part of it. I thought about and quickly dismissed the usual suspects. Mirror Master? No way. He would turn me into a plate glass if given the chance, but energy bolts? Not his M.O. The Pied Piper? He'd play a tune on his flute and force me to take a long run off a short pier. Captain Cold, he'd love to turn me into a flashicle, but burning me, definitely not his style. I knew that Cheetah, if given the chance, would strangle the life out of Wonder Woman, and the Joker would gladly put a bullet into Batman, but I'd always taken some sort of perverse pride knowing my rogues gallery of foes seemed to possess a greater theatricality in orchestrating their attacks. It never prevented me from stopping them as quickly as I could, but their ingeniously complex plans actually made my battles with them a little more interesting than taking on your common variety thug. This attack, however, was devoid of their usually demented Elan, which proved to me none of them were responsible. 
I wasn't getting anywhere. I knew how I died, so for the present, I put aside the who. My next question was, where did I die? That was when I realized the world surrounding me was out of focus. There was light and color, but everything was swirling around me like I was inside a kaleidoscope. Images blurred past faster than even I could see, and it wasn't just the world that was moving. I was running faster than sound, faster than light, faster than I'd ever attempted before, and I didn't even know it. I wasn't on Earth. I wasn't in space. I was in some place I'd never been. I also accepted that I was very calm, as if I belonged here. Although I knew I would soon be dead, at this precise moment, I still existed. I wasn't in heaven, and my calmness belied any possibility of this being hell. So, where was here? And how did I get here? Suddenly, I remembered. The wall of white energy. I want to talk about Iris. She was a reporter, I was a policeman. We met over the death of a mobster. She was hunting for a juicy murder story, but I ruled his death a mundane suicide. She distrusted cops. We existed to make her life difficult. I disliked reporters. They cared less for facts than for headlines. We were natural enemies. Look, I need one picture. Just say yes and I'll be out of your crew cut in 30 seconds. When we're done. No photographers will be allowed in until then. My deadline's in five minutes. It's gonna be another hour. Trust me, he'll still be dead. Come on! Officer, please move these people behind the tape. Damn it, you're the most obnoxious, conceited... I was in love with her five seconds after we met. It was obvious she was beautiful. But there was a fierce intelligence behind her bright hazel green eyes, as well as a deep, wicked gleam that told me this was a woman who enjoyed her life. Iris had a cutting, dirty sense of humor and was easily the only woman who ever made me laugh. It's not that she told jokes, per se. She just saw the world in a peculiar, skewed way that tickled me. The myth of the science geek with his nose permanently buried in a book, test tube in hand, who couldn't get a date even if he paid for one, didn't hold true for me. I dated a number of beautiful girls, both in high school and college. But Iris was the kind of beautiful I couldn't get out of my mind. Not that I let her know that on our first date, or the second. Or maybe, never enough. I tend not to let my emotions show all that often. That's one of those science geek myths that is true. I don't know anyone who can explain why one falls in love. We certainly shared a few interests, especially movies and music, but we rarely had the same opinions. Politics? Opposite ends of the spectrum. Art? I was into Impressionism. She could talk for hours about Dada, and I still wouldn't get it. She was a reporter who had extensively traveled the world, while I was pretty much a homebody stuck in Central City and generally pleased to be there. I was fairly quiet, while Iris, well, Quiet wasn't one of those adjectives that readily came to mind. Though we were obviously drawn to each other, it shouldn't by all rights have worked out. If I have any regrets, it's that we dated for far too long. Why hadn't I proposed to her after that first picnic lunch, or during dinner the next night, or any time over the next few years? There were so many opportunities, and I wasted them all. What was I waiting for? The answer should have been obvious. As fast as I am now, that's how slow I used to be. Slow as in methodical. Take your time, Barry. Be sure before you make a move. Double check your findings. Then, check them all over again. A necessity in science. A preposterous waste of precious time in life. What would we have been like if we'd gotten married before the lightning shattered those bottles, spraying me with a catalog of chemicals, turning me into some kind of speed freak? Would we have had kids? How old would they be today? Would our lives have been gingerbread, picket fence normal? Or would we have been touring the world, always in search of a new adventure? I could easily see myself at her side, going wherever the new story was, meeting sultans and pirates and... All that incredible stuff I loved reading about in those wonderful, musty old comics. 
Usually I don't dwell on those woulda, coulda, shouldas, those life journey regrets. Can't change the past, they always say. Though isn't that what I needed to do now? Change the past and change the future. I had to change the future. That wall, that wall of white energy, antimatter. Whatever it touched disintegrated instantly. The newscast said one million died in the first 20 minutes. I know that estimate was low. Be careful, Barry. Don't worry, I'll be right back. My God! The wall was more than 200 feet high and a half mile wide. Skyscrapers disappeared as it engulfed them. And people, they just ceased to be. I've got you. Hang on. Don't, don't look back. I saved more than a hundred, only to see him vanish a heartbeat later in that terrible white wall. Their deaths were horribly that simple. <sighs> then it came for me. I turned to run, but I was surrounded. I sped up my metabolism, hoping to put on enough speed to burst through to the other side. But it was impossible. I was surrounded by whiteness. Iris. The antimatter would soon be coming for her, too. She may already be dead. For a nanosecond, I felt impossibly cold. And I felt nothing. My last thought was that I hadn't told her how much I loved her. Alexander Luther of Earth 3. It makes no sense. Alexander Luther was the first to note the temperature changes that suddenly overtook Earth 3. The red skies came next. They blanketed the globe, blotting out the sun and stars, casting the world in a deep, dark scarlet haze. Luther investigated the aberration, but found nothing wrong. Yes, the sky was red, but no, there were no apparent toxins in the air. No discernible reason for the change. What is going on? Alexander didn't know that in the cosmic crisis already in motion, his universe and his world were about to be destroyed. He was also unaware that he had a doppelganger on a world called Earth-1, Lex Luthor, a criminal mastermind who fought a great hero named Superman. Alexander would have been further stunned to know that there was a second version of himself on Earth-2, this one, an insane scientist named Alexei Luther. That Luther would have been more than anxious to destroy his planet and himself if it also meant the elimination of his long-fought rival, a much older and slightly less powerful Superman. Alexander's planet, which would be known as Earth-3, was one of the many anomalies that existed in the multiverse. His world was ruled by superpowered criminals such as Ultraman, his world Superman, Power Ring, Earth-3's Green Lantern, and Owl Man, Batman's genetic double, among others. Alexander Luther, who shared a tenuous DNA relationship with all the other Luthers in the multiverse, had no criminal inclinations. He was a scientist, inarguably his Earth's greatest. He was 22 when he discovered a permanent cure for the six deadliest forms of cancer. By 26, he had eliminated most genetic diseases, and by 29, he had perfected an inexpensive desalinization process. As long as Alexander didn't interfere with the crime syndicate, which is what Ultraman and the other villains called themselves, he was left alone to do whatever he wanted. Luther returned home to his wife, the former Lois Lane. You okay? You mean since you asked me that an hour ago? <laughs> Relax, nothing's happening today, I feel great. You're sure you don't need anything? <sighs> he was hopeless. She was pregnant with her first child and was more beautiful than ever. Dinner was meatloaf, garlic mashed potatoes, and glazed carrots. She also prepared a chocolate souffle for dessert. Not their usual fare, but Lois was feeling especially edgy. She spent the day cooking and cleaning, not something she ever enjoyed doing. She was nesting. 
which she knew meant that the baby was due any minute. I don't get it. The weather patterns are insane. Alexander picked his way through the potatoes. They were his favorite, but his mind was elsewhere. They're not based on ocean currents. There's no reason for the sudden polar warming or the tornadoes or any of it. And those red skies, God, nothing makes any sense. Whenever his thoughts wouldn't coalesce, he would talk to Lois. She exerted an almost eerie calming effect that let his mind wander until the solution, as if from nowhere, suddenly came full-blown. She took his hand. You're going to be working late, I can tell. But before you do, come on. I think you need a snuggle. In their bedroom, they lay coupled together, spooning, his hand caressing her swollen stomach, with no way of knowing that their child would be born before the night was out. It's going to be a girl, I can tell. <laughs> a boy. Feel his kick? Definitely a boy. But born to what? Alexander wondered. Weather anomalies? Red skies? Were they a harbinger of something else? Lois? You're asleep. Ah, oh, good. You need it. Skies don't color shift without reason. Something weird is happening, but I have no idea what. He looked vaguely up at the ceiling. Give me a clue. Anything will do. The red skies are just the beginning. Alexander looked, but no one was there. He checked his security alarm. The warning light was glowing a steady, safe green. Who's there? Where are you? Alexander, a wall of antimatter will sweep over this planet and destroy everything. Wait a second, you know me? Who are you? This planet is already dead, but there are other Earths that can still be saved. Other Earths? Alexander, you need to save your son. My son? This is what you have to do. Alexander Luther listened. I knew I wasn't on Earth, but I also wasn't in space. There was no ground under me, yet I was able to run. Actually, I couldn't stop running. Without any effort on my part, my speed kept increasing. A moment later, everything went white. I was faster than light. It was impossible, but I kept picking up speed, running even faster. Images appeared in the shifting patterns of light and shade. No. No. Superman. He was crying. The man I knew was impossibly strong physically and spiritually. What could possibly have happened to him? Everything good about me, I owe to him. Kid Flash, Wally, my nephew, was also in tears, holding my ring in his hand. Next to him was the Psycho Pirate, one of our Justice League enemies. There were more images, each overlapping the other like a cartoon flipbook. Green Lantern was fighting some sort of black, featureless shadow creature. What was it? They're everywhere! Jay Garrick, the Flash of Earth 2, was surrounded by hundreds of the same shadow things. What are these things? Batman was battling the Joker. Suddenly, both of them looked at me. Flash, Batman, can you see me? But in another second, they were both gone. Supergirl was flying toward Gotham City. I saw Captain Marvel. I knew he was from Earth S. He was also fighting a shadow creature. Alongside him was the Robin of Earth 2. How was that possible? They were from different Earths in different parts of the multiverse. What could have brought them together? I saw heroes who I knew lived in the future and some who came from the past. They were all besieged by even more of those living shadows. What were they? Where did they come from? There were people I didn't know. A green cloaked figure with dark, frightened eyes. A woman, blonde hair, dressed in blue. She could fly. I saw an infant. Half his body was flesh, but the other half, dark as space, with stars burning through his skin. Who was he? What was he? I saw hands reach for the baby, place him inside his ship, and then launch it into space. I saw that damned white wall of antimatter again. I knew somehow that an entire universe had suddenly ceased to exist. Was that even possible? I ran faster as more images spun around me. I found myself in a dark stone room. I was a prisoner. <sighs> Energy bonds restrained me. I struggled against them, trying to break free. Nothing worked. But then, suddenly, I was loose. 
I was in another place. Not a room, but a cavernous pit. In front of me was a monstrous globe of burning energy, and it was spinning like a top, as if there were suddenly two of me. I saw myself, my other self, running around the blazing top. What was I doing? I could see myself struggling. Then, suddenly, there was a horrible burst of light, and I disintegrated. I saw myself die. I've already told you what that was like. Now, I was in my laboratory at Central City Police Headquarters. It was night. There was a calendar on the wall. Today's date was circled with a notation. Date tonight with Iris. Don't be late. That was underlined. Twice. I knew this date. It was the night that changed my life. Ah! I watched myself lying on the floor unconscious. Uh, oh. Oh. When I awoke, I was unaware how my life had changed. I watched as I dried myself off and cleaned up. I was so innocent then. Look at me. Oh gosh, I was supposed to meet Iris 15 minutes ago. I was always late. Time had a way of running away on me. Iris would always give me a hard time about it. God, Barry, you're the slowest man on earth. Not anymore. I began to run. Faster and faster. I had no idea what happened, but there I was, outrunning a car. The soles of my shoes were burning. Look at my face. I was afraid. And yet, I was also enjoying myself. By the time I was able to force myself to stop... Holy cow. I had run all the way to Iowa. My God. There. That look. That's the moment I knew what had happened. As improbable as it may have been, those chemicals were my heavy water. I'd become the Flash. I'd become the superhero who was my hero. I was suddenly elsewhere, not on my Earth, but one I'd never seen before. The images continued to rush past me. There were heroes here, as there were on so many Earths in the multiverse. I saw this world's Superman, but he was black. Supergirl was his wife, not his cousin. Hawkman and Hawkgirl were brother and sister, not husband and wife. There was a Batman and Robin here too, but they were father and son. And this Batman had a wife as well as two other children. Wonder Woman and Aquaman were also different. I found this world's Flash. His name was Tanaka Ray, and he was Japanese. His wife was Hoshi. They had two children, a boy and a girl. I watched them playing together and I thought of Iris. What if she and I had married earlier? Would our children be seven and eight, the same as these kids? Would our family be as loving? What if, what if, this world was different from mine, but it was also too much the same? Then, I watched this Earth and its universe disappear. In an instant, it had been destroyed. Was this the fate of my Earth as well? Barry Allen, we were as you. Once swift as lightning, now gone. I couldn't see who was speaking. Where are you? Untold millions of universes have already been removed from existence. Before the multiverse ends, our essences, your soul, and the speed force itself will be destroyed. We are becoming weaker. A speed force? Is that where I am? Talk to me! I saw a place of metal walls. It was large and cavernous, and through its windows I saw I was not on Earth. The room was filled with hundreds of people. Most were costumed like me. I recognized some. Superman, Batman, Green Lantern. All of them had been brought to whatever this place was. I looked around me to figure out where I was, but everything had disappeared. The one fact I cobbled together was that somewhere the heroes of many Earths would be, or already had been, brought together to fight whatever was destroying the multiverse. Despots always wanted something. Unlimited wealth, absolute control, or the number one answer, total power. But why would anyone want to destroy entire universes? What would be left for them to control? Who would there be to rule? I understood one other truth. Whatever happened, I'd been shown, much too graphically in fact, that I was not going to survive. I could accept that. 
I'd been running on borrowed time ever since I first put on my flash suit. But what I wanted to know was if there was any way I could stop this crisis before I died. The voices told me I was already dead, but my essence, they said it was my soul, was still alive. Wait a minute. I was already dead? Not possible. My death was in the future. But if it already happened, did that also mean it wasn't preventable? And if I was murdered, then why didn't I remember it now? It made no sense. How could I be dead? How could this body just be... my soul? I wasn't a very religious man, but I certainly believed in God, or at least in some kind of almighty spirit. I was killed, but I was still here, still thinking. There had to be a reason I didn't vanish from existence. I needed to organize and analyze the facts as I would any puzzle. It was the only way I could think my way through this. Brain Boy Barry, they called me that in high school, was hard at work again. I knew I'd been a prisoner. I saw myself chained to a wall, and I needed to find out where that took place. Once I had the where, I might discover the who. Question 2. Why did he hold me prisoner? Why didn't he just kill me right away? Question 3. And if I was dead, why didn't I stay dead? There was only one logical answer to my second question. I was needed or more likely my super speed power was needed. The voices said the speed force would be destroyed even before the multiverse, which I assume meant the killer was absorbing my super speed energy to power his weapons. Was that why I was his prisoner? Was that why the speed force was weakening? If this speed force dissipated before I saved the universe, would I disappear along with it? Was there a ticking clock on my saving the multiverse? I needed to slow down. No point asking questions to which I couldn't possibly guess the answer. I couldn't think in terms of saving an infinite number of lives. The task would be too daunting. I had to concentrate instead on what was possible. Save Iris. Save just one life. Then the others will fall into place. I was still in the speed force watching the past, present, and future scroll by me. I saw a swirling nothingness. I saw an explosion of light. I saw the dawn of man. The present was constantly shifting, but the future I saw was finite. I saw tomorrow and the year and the millennium after that. But after that, there was nothing. In the future, there was nothing. That future was also moving closer. A year was suddenly shaved off it, then another. Time was being eaten away. Did that mean our unknown enemy succeeded? Did that mean we failed to stop him before we could even try? I've never accepted failure as a possibility. Despite seeing it, the future was not yet written. I knew it could be changed. It had to be changed. But not from inside the speed force. If there was a chance to affect the outcome, I had to return to the real world. My only question was, how? Pariah Home Universe Unknown He watched the world die, as he had countless worlds before. That he was brought here, to Earth-19 by his count, meant that there was no hope for its survival. As always, the weather changed drastically, blistering heat and intense cold. Ice caps melted. There were floods, earthquakes, and tornadoes. Hurricanes ravaged cities. Sadly for him, it was always the same. In the next minutes, he would look for the red skies. These were inherently harmless, but as always, they foretold the planet's final doom. The shadow demons appeared at the same time as the wall of white antimatter. Both swept across the planet and destroyed everything they touched. But what always bothered him the most were the desperate cries from the people who prayed for a salvation that would never come. He knew it was only a matter of hours before this universe and its uncountable population was erased from existence. Men and women ran in panic, grabbing their children, hoping to find a safe haven. They couldn't know that there was no safe place. And never once, not since this all began, had there been any hope. His green cloak billowed in the wind, and dust stung his large black-rimmed eyes, 
forcing tears he thought long ago had run dry. Haven't I suffered enough? Don't make me watch this anymore! But there was no one to hear him. Many planets had superheroes, and in each ongoing destruction, Pariah knew that they would come together, sometimes even with their enemies at their side, and use their powers to fight the shadow demons, or try to stop the ever-encroaching antimatter wall. But the heroes were always helpless. Their pain would soon be over, but his, as always, continued. Why do I have to keep living through this hell again and again? He already knew the answer. He had sinned, and this was his terrible punishment. He was brought to each universe before it was destroyed, and he was forced to watch its people die and hear their final cries. But worst of all, he had to accept that there was absolutely nothing he could do. Once again, he saw the white wall move across the planet, discriminating against nothing, absorbing everything. Everyone who died was innocent, but the children were the hardest for him to forget. Every so often, one would see him staring helplessly at the destruction. In their innocence, they would reach out and plead with him to take their hand and pull them away from that cold white wall. Please help me, don't let me die. Do something, save me. Save my sister, save my brother, save my parents. As always, Pariah would try, hoping this time would be different, but always knowing it never would. <laughs> He took a child in his arms as antimatter swept over them. I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. He held her close, hoping somehow that his immortal body would protect her. But as the wall moved on, only he was left standing in the black nothingness. Even the planet he had been standing on was gone. He felt the familiar burning inside his stomach. It told him that he was about to be brought to yet another world in yet another universe. And when he got there, he would be forced to watch it die too. Why me? There was no answer. There never was. Even when I tried, the speed force wouldn't let me stop running. I wanted to slow down, but instead I found myself racing even faster. Strangely, as much as I knew that should have bothered me, it didn't. I felt at ease here, eerily calm. Yes, I knew there was an urgency that demanded my attention. I was, after all, supposed to save the world. But I felt strangely at home in this place of speed. I didn't want to leave. Instead, I wanted to find the other speedsters, the voices, whoever they were. I wondered if they shared the same problems and concerns I once had. Were they as impatient with everything as I used to be? Did the world move slowly for them too? People took forever to think. One word conversation seemingly dragged on for months. Come on, man, move it, spit it out, say it already. For someone who had once been the slowest man on earth, after I became the Flash, I had to learn, of all things, patience. Slow down. Listen to them. It's not their fault they're slow. I could live a whole life before they finished drinking a soda. I could be in Central City one moment and in Paris the next. I could eat a full banquet in an instant and metabolize it just as quickly. Actually, I had to constantly eat. I burned food so fast it was the only way to keep my energy levels constant. Learning to think slow, to walk instead of run, even relearning how to breathe seemed to take me forever. I had to decrease my heart rate. I had to learn how long it took to lift a cup off a table, how much time to take a shower, how many breaths do I draw in a minute, do I run a mile in the blink of an eye, or do I let it take longer? I had to relearn everything I once took for granted. Patience. Something kept nagging at me. The outside world. The real world. There's danger there, isn't there? Oh, right. I remember now. Something about the end of the universe. But it's so peaceful here. I belong here. I could die here. Be careful, Barry. Don't worry. I'll be right back. But I wouldn't. Iris. Was she still alive? Did the Earth still exist? Was the future still changeable? Iris. The speed force was drawing me into it and didn't want to let me go. This was to be my final home, but I knew I couldn't let myself rest. 
Not yet. Yes, I could accept that I had already died, although by the paradoxes of time my death had not yet occurred. Yes, my world was destroyed, but that hadn't happened yet either. The future and the past were all the same here, and the longer I stayed, perhaps the happier I'd be. But then everything else would be destroyed. Everyone I knew and cared about would be dead. Actually, it would be worse. They would never have been. I had to go home. I was on a spaceship of some sort. No, it was a satellite, and I was in a small laboratory. The boy I saw before, half flesh, half antimatter, how did I know that, was no longer an infant. I was looking at a three-year-old. Had that much time passed? A woman was in the room. She was human, blonde, very pretty, and dressed in skin-tight blue armor. I'd seen her before. I had the impression she had been talking to the boy. She left the room. Suddenly, I was in another room, filled with bizarre electronic equipment and viewing screens. A figure sat near an instrument array. He was male, humanoid, but not human. Almost bald, his hair was shaped into a widow's peak of cornrow strands that lay flat across his forehead. He wore a white tunic over blue armor. I have to do this. I can't help myself. You know he's controlling me. That's his way. You should know that. But it's all right. I don't think anyone could resist him, Lila. Don't call me that! He doesn't like that name. I'm Harbinger! You know I don't want to hurt you. The Monitor turned away from her. Please, Monitor, stop me from hurting you. You know I can't do that, Lila. Harbinger! Why can't you understand my name is Harbinger? Harbinger, then. Listen to me. I want you to forgive yourself. Are you trying to trick me? No, that's for you to remember after. What are you talking about, old man? It's time. Do what you have to. She stared, her red eyes deepening to black. I... I don't want to do it. I know you can stop me, so why won't you? If I knew what was coming, why didn't he? I ran at them, intending to push them apart. But instead, I raced through both images. I was still in the Speed Force while they were in the real world. Run, you idiot! She's gonna kill you! He turned as if he heard me, although I knew that was impossible. The look in his eyes seemed to say, it's for the best. He closed his eyes and lowered his head as she raised her hands. <laughs> He looked up and whispered some words to no one I could see. And then he was dead. Oh, monitor! Lila, or oh, Harbinger, God. fell to her oh, knees. Oh, dear. There was a flash of light and I was back in time, but just two minutes ago. I the monitor was in the room, she entered, they talked, myself. and she killed you him again. I have to do this. I can't help myself. It I happened three more times, as if I was watching I a constant loop of a slow motion replay. Was this some pivotal moment I was being shown until I understood it? Who was the Monitor? Who was Lila? Who made her kill him? As he fell in flames at my feet, I instinctively reached to help. What? Are you talking to me? I don't understand you. I was still in the Speed Force, watching the outside world. Was he already dead? Was this the past or the future? How do I find you? How do I save you? And then, everything went black. I barely heard the voices and couldn't tell where they came from. You understand the mission. Don't worry. It's not a problem. I recognized that voice. It was the killer's voice. If you're sure, then it's time. Metal walls surrounded me. There was a floor under me. The lights here were dim. I was no longer in the Speed Force. I was on the Monitor's ship, his actual ship. But how did I get here? 
I remembered he died and I wanted to help. Then there was blackness, nothingness, unconsciousness. Just as suddenly, I was here. Did I somehow bring myself here by saying I wanted to be here? Had I controlled the speed force, making it take me where I needed to go? We're going to need help. It was his voice. He was someplace near. I realized this had to be the past. I'd seen the woman Lila kill the monitor, but I just heard him speak. He was still alive. That meant there was time to warn him about Lila's future treachery. The ship was designed like a globe, approximately a half mile in diameter. The interior walls were black metal, a steel alloy similar in look to our own, but slightly different, oilier, slicker looking. I ran past a dozen laboratories crowded with equipment and machines. Some looked like weapons, but the majority were so alien in design, I couldn't identify them, let alone use them. I had four university degrees, but I felt like Homer Simpson during a meltdown. Here was something I did recognize. View screens were built into the walls, and all of them were showing scenes from different worlds. I was in the room where I witnessed the Monitor's death. I recognized Earth 2, Jay Garrick's Earth, on one screen. The Monitor was observing not just one universe, but the multiverse, when he was here, which he wasn't at the moment. Good reception, too. Cable or satellite? I looked around me. Duh, definitely satellite. On one screen I saw my own Earth, and the sky was still blue. Apparently, I'd been sent back in time to before the red skies, to before the shadow demons and the white wall of antimatter, to before my planet and my universe were destroyed. I stared at the multiverse of worlds displayed on the view screens. Why was the monitor watching them? I had seen Lila kill him, and I made the logical assumption she was a murderer and he was her victim. But what if I was wrong? Was he the killer, and was she trying to stop him? It took less than a second to find them. Sometimes it's good to be the fastest man, dead or alive. But will they listen? Lila's eyes were blue, not red or black as I'd seen them before, and I saw them looking at the monitor with respect, not hate. The harbinger I saw in the Speed Force acted as if she were anxious to kill him. This Lila was very different. She was gentle. In fact, she looked at him as if she loved him. They didn't see me, even when I stood in front of them and waved my hands like an idiot to get their attention. That proved I was dead, but did it mean I was a ghost? Was I only able to watch the universe go to hell, or could I do something about it? Patience. Sort out the evidence. I, I don't think they'll believe me. They'll believe. Maybe not at first, but when you show them the evidence. <laughs> Right. I go up to these superheroes and villains and say, excuse me, the multiverse is coming to an end. Then I say, see this? I show them the proof. Oh, and why am I here? They'll ask. Well, it's because we, we being me and some alien guy you've never heard of before, need you to save the universe for us. I wouldn't believe that. Why should they? I'd leave out the part about the alien guy. On one of the view screens, I saw something that looked like a 10-story tall tuning fork cobbled together out of mismatched circuit boards, bailing wire, and spit. Well, maybe it was a bit more sophisticated than that, but not much. The monitor waved his hands over a control panel. On the screen, I saw a light on the fork turn itself on. Unless you recruit an army to protect my machines, you know there's no hope. Lila stared at the view screen. But will it work? It has to, doesn't it? Lila placed her palms together and held them in front of her yoga style. She closed her eyes and rested her head on her fingertips as if in prayer. She was nothing like the woman I'd seen in the Speed Force. But someone, who, was going to control her. When? And sooner or later, she was going to kill the Monitor. Why? Don't let her go! Of course, the Monitor couldn't hear me. I'd never felt so helpless. Lila's body shimmered. And suddenly, there were two of her. A second later, there were four. Then eight. And finally, 16 seemingly perfect copies. Which one was going to kill the Monitor? The Monitor studied the group. Remember, bring me only the ones I asked for. Of course. The Harbingers bowed to him, and then as one, disappeared. I wanted to follow, but which one? As fast as I was, I couldn't, like her, be in 16 places at the same time. The Monitor turned in my direction. I knew he couldn't see me, but his eyes fixed on mine. 
had to be a coincidence. Had to be. There are futures that can't be undone. He started out of the room, then paused at the door and looked back as if indicating for me to follow. Well, what else did I have to do? Green Lantern of Earth One. John Stewart glanced at the glowing green ring on his finger and allowed himself a wide grin. It had been only six months since the Guardians turned the power ring over to him after its previous owner, Hal Jordan, retired, and only three since he was asked to join the Justice League of America. He still felt giddy every time he flew above the clouds, birds soaring at his side, tilting their wings, catching the currents. This is the life. I could fly like this forever. Unfortunately, like today, he was usually on his way to stem one emergency or another. The ocean below him may have seemed endless, but John knew it would only be a matter of minutes before Australia rushed into view. So many of the so-called superheroes, he didn't think of himself as one, but he knew others did, that came with the job, always looked, well, angry. Or in Batman's case, cold and emotionless. Hey man, we can fly. Why are you taking this for granted? Look at all the incredible things we can do. You gotta be enjoying this, man. You just gotta. That's what he wanted to shout at them. It seemed to John that Batman never got joy from anything. Wonder Woman was also an enigma. She was beyond beautiful, always warm and friendly, but John sensed an unbridgeable gulf between her and the rest of the League. She should be standing alongside giants, battling great mythological beasts and monsters, not stopping crimes in Washington, D.C. John was told she was an Amazon and that her mother once made love to the half-god Heracles. Gods never walked the streets John Stewart grew up on. John believed that of all of them, Superman understood. He never seemed to get angry or lose his temper, but he wasn't the boring Boy Scout Batman accused him of being either. Superman just believed in doing the right thing, as if the very possibility of there being any other option never crossed his mind. Sydney had been decimated by tsunamis, freakish 300-foot waves that crashed through anything that stood in their way. Fort Denison, built to protect the city from invasion, its brick and stone crushed instantly to dust, fell into the sea first, churning up waves, swapping ferries and cargo boats that slowly chugged their way to the south shore. Like the coat hanger for which it was affectionately nicknamed, the harbor bridge easily buckled, its rounded spans collapsing at their hinges. The circular key found itself buried under 70 feet of unseasonably icy water. John concentrated. His will energized his power ring, giving its green light form and substance. The light reshaped itself into giant emerald walls, which John rammed into the harbor bed as protective shields against the terrible waves. The ocean pummeled furiously against them, but they held firm. That ought to do the trick for the moment. John turned to see the ocean was already crushing its way through the city. He flew over the harbor and made his way to the city center, where waves were about to crush the Queen Victoria building, its hundred-year-old Byzantine construction hiding a very modern mall. It was two in the afternoon, the stores crowded with shoppers taking advantage of midweek specials, not realizing that their lives were close to being snuffed out. Not on my watch. John closed his eyes, envisioning a massive curved tube like a water park slide. His power ring flashed its light and formed a two-mile-long tunnel which scooped up the waves and sent them crashing out to sea again. John knew his walls would protect Sydney from new waves, while his network of lace tunnels would redirect most of the water already in the city back out again. <sighs> Another crisis averted. Thank the Guardians. The Guardians. He thought of his alien benefactor, through whose diminutive blue-skinned frames coursed so much power. He had met them face to face on Oa, their homeworld, only once, but that was enough to understand who they were and for him to agree to become part of their mission. The Guardians had come together countless ages ago to protect the universe from natural disasters and unwanted intrusions. John had no idea what started them on their crusade, but he knew that they had somehow created an energy source of nearly limitless power. They contained it in a massive lantern-shaped device that could be tapped as needed by a power ring, such as the one John wore. John was only one of many ring wearers. He estimated that there were more than 3,000 Green Lanterns, as they called themselves, 
scattered across the universe. The lanterns were of different species and different cultures. To be privileged to become a ring wearer, they had to agree to abandon their personal prejudices and act in concert alongside other races, often those with conflicting beliefs from their own. They would no longer be serving just their own world, but an entire sector of space. A Green Lantern could be called upon to negotiate treaties between warring worlds or to use the power of his ring to stop that war, if need be. John embraced the idea instantly. Within weeks of becoming a Green Lantern, he was asked to replace Hal Jordan, the former Lantern, in the Justice League. In less than six months' time, John Stewart's life had changed completely. John realized that the Australian tsunami was not a natural occurrence, no more so than the erupting volcanoes along the equator that Superman flew to investigate, or the frigid weather that swept across Africa. Wonder Woman and Hawkgirl were checking that one out. His powering indicated unnatural fluctuations in air pressure surrounding Sydney Harbor, but nothing powerful enough to trigger such massive destruction. The ring sensed that something powerful was moving toward the planet, but it didn't know what. He tried to use the ring to contact the Guardians, hoping that they would know what to do. Knowing them, John assumed they had probably encountered these anomalies before. John's signal died in transmission. Something, perhaps whatever was causing the anomalies, was blocking it. The Guardian's energy was nearly limitless. What in the universe could be powerful enough to jam a power ring? Green Lantern! John saw her hovering about 30 yards away. She had blonde hair and wore blue armor. Is this your doing? John nodded toward the waves that crashed off the still glowing power ring created walls. She looked confused. My name is Harbinger. We need you. So do they. John Stewart looked down at the people scrambling out of the Victoria Mall. And I think they need me more. Unless you come with me, they're all going to die. We've come to help you. We're the only hope this world has. We? Please, John Stewart. You have to believe me. How do you know my name? Your world isn't the only one in danger. Even your masters on Oa will perish unless we stop the murderer. She knows about the Guardians. That isn't possible. Why couldn't I contact them? What's happened to them? If you're behind this... The multiverse is on the verge of destruction. Help us, Green Lantern, to help you. John glanced back at the Sydney Harbor. The waters were retreating. All right. But if you try anything now... But they had already disappeared. I entered a huge circular steel-walled chamber. It seemed that there were monitor screens in most rooms of this place, but here, there were dozens of rows of view screens set into prefab niches, approximately three meters above my head, each focused on different worlds, and as I quickly noted, different universes. The monitor sat at a computer panel beneath one of the screens and adjusted its image. Earth 3. Who was he talking to? It couldn't be me, he didn't even know I was there. On the screen, red skies covered a planet already deep into the crisis. I saw the white wall of antimatter edge its way across the city. It was erasing buildings and people as if they were unneeded pencil drawings. I was sick. I wanted to throw up or scream or to react somehow, but all I could do was watch. On the screen, a man who reminded me of Superman flew at the white wall. The monitor focused the view screen on him. Ultraman. Earth 3 is ruled by supervillains, but today they're fighting to save their world. Was he talking to me? Ultraman hefted a truck and threw it at the encroaching whiteness as if he thought that would be enough to slow it down. The truck quietly disappeared inside, swallowed whole. He then aimed his heat vision at the wall, also to no effect. He tried to freeze it with a blast of arctic breath, but it continued pushing forward. It wasn't gonna stop. Not for Ultraman. And I feared when the time came. Not for Superman, either. Finally, Ultraman shrugged his shoulders and flew at it, turning himself into his own weapon. Valiantly and foolishly thinking he could fight whatever it was from inside. I fight to the end! I couldn't turn from the view screen as he entered the whiteness was gone. Another man jetted past the relentless wall of white. Costumed in blue and red, he flew with miniature jetpack strapped to his back. Was he another supervillain? He was tall, lanky, and bald, but sported a close-cropped red beard. Alexander Luther. 
The monitor again adjusted the screen. We followed him as he flew home. His wife was sitting up in their bed. She looked like the lowest lane of my earth. She was holding a newborn boy close to her as if afraid to let him go. Her smile was warm as she mouthed a kiss to Luther. He lay down next to her, taking the baby and gently patting his cheek. It's time. I'd seen the baby before, during my time in the Speed Force. He was slightly older then, and his body equally divided between areas of matter and antimatter. I'd been taught that was a scientific impossibility, but physics couldn't negate what I saw. But here, in his father's arms, the baby was normal. When would he change? You're sure this will save him? Luther nodded. The voice told me how. And judging from what I've seen, we don't have a choice. He heard voices? Were those the same voices I had heard in the Speed Force? Luther finally relaxed as his arm wrapped around Lois. He looked at her, smiling the same smile I know I must have when I see Iris getting dressed every morning preparing for work. And the rest of us? She didn't need to complete her question. She took the boy from Luther and held her family as tightly and as closely as she could. Events are already in motion. Lila is going to kill me. My death is necessary, required actually. Just as to save the multiverse, I need the child. The monitor kept staring at the screen. I need him brought to me. He turned back to his work, and that was when everything went black again. Lois Lane of Earth 2. When she first met Clark, Lois took an instant dislike to him. He was handsome, no doubt, well-built in that tractor-pulling, naive farm boy kind of way. She fully expected that his hair was normally tussled and topped with a distracting cowlick, instead of plastered down and parted with hair cream. And he always stood at her desk, hunched over like Quasimodo, his eyes darting right and left to avoid direct contact with hers as he wheezed streams of apologies instead of defending his position as a real man would. Lois thought that he may have been built like Clark Gable, but Clark Kent acted like a timid version of the Cowardly Lion of Oz. He'd never do, she was sure. And with that first impression, she dismissed him from her life. What an idiot I was. On behalf of the citizens of Metropolis, it is my great honor and pleasure to present you with the Weisinger Award for Lifetime Contribution to the Well-Being of Our Fair City. Lois watched the real man beneath the crumpled shirts and stammering manner accept another award from the ever-grateful citizens of Metropolis. She watched from the back of the crowd, and though he smiled and waved at the people applauding him, only she knew how ill at ease he actually was. Despite all his incredible deeds, despite the world leaders he met and the distant planets to which he had traveled, he remained shy, never comfortable with acclaim, preferring not to have the spotlight of attention shown on him. He didn't see any need to be thanked for doing what needed to be done. She ran her fingers over her wedding ring. He had given it to her 47 years ago, on Valentine's Day. He was always that sweetly corny. On that day, she didn't pause to think before she slipped it on her finger. Lois had fallen in love with his stumbling and stammering years before. If you were only paying attention to all his myriad distractions, you could be forgiven for believing that Clark Kent was a clown. But once you looked into his eyes, once you saw the man beneath the pretend ticks and twitches, you saw such innate goodness that even against her wishes, he kept forcing his way back into her thoughts. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, and thank you all my friends. Lois walked across the square to the Daily Star building and took the elevator to the roof. <sighs> she sat on the edge of the roof and waited. I was feeling claustrophobic again. Lois hadn't heard him land, but then, even after all these years, she rarely did. <laughs> You know how long I've been waiting. You sure took your sweet time, Clark. You know me, always goofing off. So how was I? You were great. They loved you. Come on, let's see it. He handed her his newest medal. What do you think they'll do when I tell them I'm retiring? Lois slipped the medal in her purse to be put into the current volume of her scrapbook that night. 
Maybe you should just send them an email. It's been nice, but I'm out of here. Love the S-Man. Hell, it'd be easier than the alternative. <laughs> How to destroy a lifetime reputation in 25 words or less. But I sort of like it. You deserve it. Fifty years saving the world from itself? I'd say that's long enough. Besides, there are all the others now who will pick up the slack. I want to spend some time with you while I can. His smile faded. He was obviously getting older. His powers were still remarkable, but they had diminished somewhat over the last ten years. Superman had no idea how long he was expected to live. He wasn't an Earthman, after all. And there was nobody who could tell him what the lifespan of a Kryptonian should be, and how much of him was super, and how much was just a man. But Lois was nearly 70. With God's graces and good health, she might live another 10 or 20 years. So it wasn't asking a lot for her to want to spend them uninterrupted with the man she loved. I'll tell them next week, like I promised. But I want to tell the Justice Society first. They deserve it. He looked at her lips, curled suspiciously. <laughs> I promise, hon. Next Thursday, noon. Mm. I love you, Kal-El of Krypton. Superman, we need you. Harbinger floated some five feet above them. Lois saw no anger in this strange woman's eyes, only desperation, which made what she said even more chilling. Earth 2 is doomed, along with all the remaining worlds of the multiverse. And who are you? I am called Harbinger. Before she went into semi-retirement, Lois had been a reporter for more than 35 years. Old habits, as they say, die hard. And we're supposed to believe you why? What's supposed to be causing this? Can it be stopped? I have proof, Mrs. Kent, but it is for your husband's eyes only. He and others must meet the Monitor. He will explain what has to be done. Others? Who's the Monitor? What's his connection to this? Please, time is running short. You have to trust us, Superman. At least listen to what the Monitor has to say. Superman took Lois's hand. He could feel her pulse quicken. She didn't like not having answers. I'll be all right. Promise? She'd been through this sort of thing so many times before. But this one felt different. Ignore your reporter's instincts. Your husband is Superman. Nothing's ever been able to harm him. Nothing ever will. Lois took his right hand, brought it to her face, and let it gently hold her before lowering it to her lips. I love you. He held on to her hand as long as he could. You too. Always. He glanced back at Lois, touched his lips with a single finger, then held it out to her. She held up hers in response. Twenty yards separated them, but she could still feel his warmth. And then he was gone. Lois would take the elevator to the 33rd floor. There were friends still working here she could visit with for a few moments. Then she would talk to Clark's assistant editor, barely out of kindergarten before she retired, to pitch him a possible feature story idea. After that, she might call Lucy or Lana to join her for dinner at Fabricini's. She would then head home and watch some television before finally, along about one or two in the morning, falling asleep. Thursday, noon. It can't come too soon. <laughs>